The New Testament lesson comes from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 1 through 12. Now, 1 Thessalonians is the first letter that we have written by the Apostle Paul. It was written, we think, around 50 in the Common Era, about 20 years after the death and resurrection of Jesus. Now, Paul had started this small church in Thessalonica, and then he moved on from there to Athens and then to Corinth. But he couldn't find his way back to Thessalonica, and so he sent Timothy, one of his co-workers, ahead of him to encourage the young church. And then Timothy came back and reported on what he had seen and heard. And so this letter comes from Paul and Silas and Timothy. Now most Sundays, I don't get a chance to do a close reading of every verse of the sermon passage. But for this Sunday and for the next two Sundays, I'm going to focus on all the verses in the last two chapters of 1 Thessalonians. And so in some ways, these are Paul's first words, the first letter we have from him, and his last words, the final words from those chapters in Thessalonians 4 and 5. So I invite you to follow along in your bulletin as I read these verses of this passage, and I'll say a little bit about them as I go through. So verses 1 and 2. Finally, brothers and sisters, we ask and urge you in the Lord Jesus that as you learn from us how you ought to live and to please God, as in fact you are doing, you should do so more and more, for you know what instructions we gave you through the Lord Jesus. Now this section in 1 Thessalonians begins actually with words of encouragement. Paul saying, remember what I taught you earlier and keep doing the good things that I know you are already doing. And this tone and these uh, admonitions are very similar to what's found in the first three chapters of 1 Thessalonians. Verses 3 through 8. For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you abstain from fornication, that each one of you know how to control your own body in holiness and honor, not with lustful passion like the Gentiles who do not know God, that no one wrong or exploit a brother or sister in this matter, because the Lord is an avenger in all these things, just as we've already told you beforehand and solemnly warned you. For God did not call us to impurity, but into holiness. Therefore, whoever rejects this rejects not human authority, but God, who also gives God's Holy Spirit to you. Now, this one always tweaks people's interest. <laughs> Paul's main focus in this passage, though, is on sanctification, how to live more fully into a life of faith. Now, he names relationships as a way to understand this process. And so he's really talking about all relationships, business relationships, professional ones, but he uses an illustration about personal relationships, marital and extramarital ones. And he's guiding us and the church to say, you are to be judged by whether your relationships are faithful and respectful and just, or whether they exploit others, whether they wrong others, whether they harm others, or whether they diminish your own spiritual growth. Now, we don't know from these documents if there were particular instances of sexual immorality that were proving to be problematic for the Thessalonican church. Paul is only making general comments here. But it's similar to things Paul wrote in other letters. For example, in the letter to the church in Rome, Paul said, I appeal to you, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. So if there are other standards of sexual behavior that were being practiced and followed in that Greek city, Paul is basically calling this young church to a higher standard. And now the last three verses, verses 9 to 12. Paul says, now concerning love. Now, pause. The word love here is the word agape, 
which is a critical word in the Christian faith. It's a self-giving love, a sacrificial and caring love. So he says, now concerning agape, love of brothers and sisters, you do not need to have anyone write to you, for you yourselves have been taught by God to love one another. And indeed you do love all the brothers and sisters throughout Macedonia. Macedonia is that region of northern Greece. And Paul says, but we urge you, beloved, do so more and more. Aspire to live quietly, to mind your own affairs, and to work with your hands as we directed you, so that you may behave properly towards outsiders and be dependent upon no one. Now, a huge topic for the early church, particularly in the days of Paul, was the idea that Christ was returning very soon. And that will actually be the focus of next week's reading. So even though the church was showing hospitality to others in need, some people were feeling like, well, they could just stop doing everything. Quit going to work, let others care for them, because Jesus was coming at any moment. And Paul is admonishing them, saying, no, don't stop your daily routines, because your actions plus your words are part of your testimony to the community around you. So keep doing exactly what you've been doing. Now is not the time to go to a hilltop and look to the heavens for Jesus to return. Now before I do my sermon, I'm going to have you reread the passage to yourself. And I want you to especially take note of a phrase in the first verse that says that our faith is how we are taught to live and to please God. So for these words and for this time together, thanks be to God. Let us pray together. Gracious God, once more we gather in your house. We gather in this community. We gather to be led by your word and your spirit. So comfort and guide us now. May the words of my mouth and meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, for you are our rock and our Redeemer. Amen. Just about eight months ago, Alex Trebek died. Alex Trebek was the well-known host of the TV quiz show Jeopardy. For years, Trebek would read answers off the Jeopardy game board, and then contestants would have to provide the correct question that goes with the answer. Now, at the risk of being too flippant, I would suggest that actually the Apostle Paul has a lot in common with Alex Trebek. Or at least, reading the letters of the Apostle Paul has a lot in common with the game process of Jeopardy. For example, in this first letter to the church in Thessalonica, basically we find in that letter an answer to conversations and questions that arose earlier when Timothy visited that young church. Timothy had just returned from there. He's reported to Paul on all that he has seen and heard. And so this passage is part of an answer to the information and questions Timothy brought to him. It's kind of our own church jeopardy challenge to guess what is the question that goes with these verses. Bible study for 400. So as we consider this little letter and this congregation, we need to remember that first off, Paul truly loved this group of people. In the opening chapters, he speaks about how he's constantly remembering them in prayer, how he sees them as an example of faith that's guiding all the other churches there in Macedonia. And in the last two sentences of chapter 3, Paul says this of encouragement to them. He says, May the Lord make you increase and abound in love for one another and for all, just as we abound in love for you. And may God strengthen your hearts in holiness, that you may be blameless before our God at the coming of our Lord Jesus. Now that's the words and the encouraging tone that comes right before chapter 4. Paul saying, strengthen your hearts in holiness as you await the coming of Christ. More importantly, it's that context out of which Paul is now going to raise the awkward subjects around lustful passions and fornication and how to behave properly 
with outsiders. Now, if you watch Jeopardy, if you pose a wrong question, Alex Trebek would politely but firmly reply no and then call on another contestant. There are a lot of churches in America that could benefit from having an Alex Trebek in the pews who is willing to say no when preachers pose the wrong questions to the answers supposedly in the Bible. So in this game, 1 Thessalonians 4 for 500, Alex, he would reply, the answer is, in verses 3 to 7, Paul writes that we should abstain from fornication, we should know how to control our own body, we should avoid lustful passion and impurity. What's the question? Yes, preacher number one, what are sexual commandments for today? No. Preacher two, what are Paul's strict rules about sexual ethics? No. Preacher three, what does the Lord say about this wicked world in which we live today? No, no, no. Now the correct response is, what is one part of how we are to live and to please God? 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 1. Now let me explain the difference between the wrong and the right Bible Jeopardy answers. The most common misuse of scripture happens when you take a verse out of context and then you're bold enough to tell someone precisely what that verse means. So phrases like abstain from fornication, control your own body in holiness and honor, I can well imagine lots of preachers quite anxious to explain precisely what those short phrases mean. But that's taking the wrong approach. The first step is to take a step back and to hear the tone that Paul is using as he writes the passage. You always examine a verse in light of the surrounding verses and chapters. So Paul has said just before this, at the end of chapter 3, may the Lord make you abound in love. May the Lord strengthen your hearts in holiness. And then at the beginning of chapter 4, he continues in that same vein and says, Friends, as you've learned from us, and as you were already doing, do so more and more. All of these are words of exhortation and encouragement. They're not words of condemnation or rebuke. Now then the second step is to recognize, as I said earlier, Paul is talking about sanctification, about growing stronger in your faith by God's grace. And so in doing this, he does offer an illustration, a brief challenge, reminding them to practice self-control, to be faithful in all of their loving relationships. But his focus is on what builds us up, not on what tears us down. His tone is ultimately positive, reminding them to be open to the Holy Spirit as they live a life that is pleasing to God. Now, unfortunately, lots of people get distracted as soon as Paul mentions sexual misdemeanors. And they're quick to demand more details because what they want is for a preacher to give them, well, a very simple and short checklist. This is what I should do and this is what I should not do in order that I can get a passing grade in life and a golden ticket into heaven. That's a natural inclination but it's not a helpful inclination. Imagine if you wake up first thing in the morning and you open your eyes and you tell yourself, I'm going to be good today. I'm going to follow all these requirements because it will pay off and get me into heaven. Now that sounds virtuous, but it's actually fairly selfish. It's doing something only in order to get something. It's calculating what you must do alone in order to be taken care of according to your wishes. So in the end, no matter who else might be helped along the way or how many public service awards you can hang on your wall, the whole beneficiary of your action was yourself. Now that's a humanist approach. It's an anthropocentric approach. And that's not what Paul is suggesting at all. 
See, back in ancient Greece, and even in ancient Rome, they had lots of rules. They had lots of codes of behavior on how you should lead a good life. You shouldn't read Paul and assume that everyone in Greece was a terrible person. Then, like now, there were exemplary people and there were not so great people. And all of them had good days and bad days. The Greek philosopher Aristotle taught that you become just by doing just acts. You become temperate by doing temperate acts. You become brave by doing brave acts. And since actions shape our character, yes, it is good and right to do things that are good and right. But there's not necessarily any place for God in these ethics. They're a moral philosophy. They're a secular philosophy. They help us live together while we seek our own happiness. And that's not a bad thing, but it's not the best thing. And you and I know this same reality exists today. There are whole sections of Barnes and Noble on self-help books. There are lots of advice columns and people of wisdom who will tell us how to lead a good life, how to be healthy, to be productive, to be purpose-driven, to be justice-seeking, to be successful. But most of these approaches do not have a space for God. They are secular ethics. They teach us, well, do good as often as you can, and therefore you'll be a good person. And help someone else, and then you'll eventually be helped in the same process. It's the Church of Aristotelian Ethics. It prompts people to do many things that are good, and that are just, and perhaps that are positive. But it always begs the question, where is God in this approach? Is there only a place for faith when we lay down and say our prayers at night? Is God simply an afterthought when we think about what happens after this life? And Paul encourages us to come up with a better answer than that. Just like the poet Mary Oliver asked us, what is it that you plan to do with your one wild and precious life. Several years ago in New York City, a man was walking through Central Park when he saw another man approaching on the sidewalk who looked a bit disheveled, and he could hear that man loudly talking to himself. And he was saying, this is my city, this is my park, and I can do anything I want. Now, making sure that the approaching man didn't have designs on something erratic, since he could do anything, the first man maintained eye contact as he got closer. And so as they passed one another, the disheveled man said in a slightly softer tone, well, I can do anything uh, within reason. So the reality is, in our secular humanist dare I say, spiritual but not religious approach. There's a lot in common with that assertion, this is my city, this is my park, and I can do anything I want within reason. Because humanity is the measure of all things. And while this is not without value, Paul, as he says elsewhere, would say to us, let me show you a more excellent way. At the start of this passage, Paul intentionally links two verbs together. We are to live and we are to please God. Paul's ethical focus is totally oriented to God first and then it moves down to us and not the other way around. So imagine your morning scenario a second time. This time imagine waking up, open your eyes, Instead of telling yourself, I'm going to do good because that's the quickest way into heaven, imagine saying to yourself first, this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Imagine reminding yourself of Jesus' promise from the end of Matthew's gospel when he says, I will be with you always, even to the end of the age. That 
awakening perspective is not so much anthropological as it is theological. Because the fundamental reality is affirming God is with us. That we exist each and every day as creations of God. We exist in relationship to a resurrected Christ. And we navigate our days guided and encouraged by the Holy Spirit. Out of that orientation emerges our ethics. It combines living and pleasing God. See, the Bible that we possess is like a giant Jeopardy board, and it contains lots of answers to it that are divided into different categories. Some are positive answers, some are negative. Some tell us things to do, some tell us things to avoid doing. Love your enemy, abstain from fornication, live quietly, mind your own affairs, work with your hands, feed the hungry, clothe the naked, visit the prisoner, welcome the stranger. Those are the answers given to us. But if we're going to buzz in as contestants to try and say what are the questions that lead to those answers, don't let your question be, what must I do in order to gain heaven? What must I do to win the game of life? Instead, let your question be, how shall I live and please God, who is before all, in all, and through all, who is my hope and my greatest confidence, and in whom my heart rejoices? Everything good follows from that. Postscript. I write my sermons on Saturday morning, and that previous sentence was where the sermon ended. I went down to the kitchen then, and I turned on my radio to hear Ira Glass lead into his program, This American Life. And he talked about riding in a car with a Methodist pastor, and he asked that pastor why so much of Scripture insists that we praise God. And he wondered, does God need all of our praise? And so I felt like in a weird way he was arguing with me having just finished my sermon. And so here's the answer, or an answer. God doesn't need our praise, although it does please God, just as Heather mentioned, it pleases God when there are things that are beautiful and creative and loving and compassionate in the world. But in orienting ourselves to God with a humble attitude of expectant faith, what we're doing is aligning ourselves with the way God's diverse, interconnected creation is meant to be. By honestly facing God first, seeking to trust God, to be led by God, to be pleasing to God, is how all good things in life follow. Now, none of us do that perfectly, none of us do it consistently, and sometimes not very well at all. But the focus is not on us. The focus is on the one that we're facing, reminding ourselves in life and in death we belong to God. Holding on to that good news as our guiding principle is pleasing to God and makes for a life worth living. May all God's people say, Amen.